A new right-to-die battle is being waged in Morristown, New Jersey. This is a landmark case because it involves possibly cutting off a feeding tube as opposed to an entire life support system. Nancy Jobes fell into a coma six years ago after a car accident. She's been fed through a tube ever since. Her family wants to cut off that tube because they say she stands no chance of recovery. And we all agree that we can, nobody can get her to res respond. And we all believe that she's not there. It's just a shell. But the Lincoln Park nursing home claims that Ms. Jobes is not terminally ill and the removal of the nutrients it is feeding her would be illegal and immoral. Terminally ill. She is not in pain, and she is not dying by any definition that anybody has agreed upon to date. Paul Armstrong, attorney representing the family of Nancy Ellen Jobes, who also represented the parents of Karen Ann Quinlan. What happened to Nancy Ellen? What were the events that led to her current state? As you know, John and, uh, and Nancy decided to have their first child. As a matter of fact, she was four and a half months pregnant when she was involved in an automobile accident. Now, in that accident, she sustained multiple fractures, but was otherwise healthy. As a matter of fact, she was anesthetized twice, at least twice, in order to reset the bones. It became apparent after the passage of time that perhaps the fetus itself had been killed, which indeed it did. And it became necessary to anesthetize Nancy in order to remove it. It was during this uh, operation uh, that as a result of uh, uh, an anesthetic misadventure, which is what we lawyers call malpractice, Nancy's heart stopped. As a result of that stoppage, there was a lack of oxygen to her brain, which rendered her in the so-called persistent vegetative state, which is characterized, as you know, by a loss of cognitive sapient awareness of self or surroundings. Those areas of the brain responsible for knowing, for loving, for understanding uh, were destroyed. 10,000 people now lie in the mysterious condition called persistent vegetative state, PVS, which will claim 3,000 more next year. Everything that could have gone wrong for Nancy went wrong. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time from, from the day of the accident. It took a long time for us to accept that there was nothing there. The doctors had to explain to us, the neurologist explained to us um, her condition and that uh, her brain was basically dead. She has these reflexes, the reflex that she would get on her face and still does occasionally. There's one that's a look of agony, and it's very hard to deal with until we finally could understand that she does not feel as we do. Um, we had a phrase when we were kids. We used to say, there's nobody home upstairs. And that's exactly what Nancy, uh, the condition she's in. There is no intelligence. And so it took us a long time to accept that. We did all the normal things that people tell you to do when someone's in a coma. We had the collage of pictures to help her identify with her previous life. And we had the radio playing. And, but it's not that kind of a coma. There is, there is no brain matter there to work. It is dead. And so um, we finally, I guess after we came out of shock, went through a regular mourning process before we were able to finally accept and then um, finally decided we would have to pursue what Nancy would, would want, that we couldn't leave her there for the projected 10 or 20 years. Dr. Fred Plum, Chief Neurologist, New York Hospital. What am I seeing then if I see tears, a grimace, even what looks like a smile? Sadly, you're seeing reflex movement and glandular patterns, which are extremely primitive, are ingrained in the species over millions of years of ancestors, non-human, and that now appear as simple reflex responses rather than an association with felt emotions or felt experiences. How long can that go on? Oh, that's the greatest, that's one of the greatest tragedies. It can go on for years. I think most of the, uh, most of the audience will know the, the sad tale of the Quinlan girl uh, who went over 10 years in, without any evidence that she ever regained any sense of herself or the world around her. The longest 
the longest example is a, was a young woman in Florida uh, who went for 37 years from the time of severe brain damage uh, during a, a minor operation until the time she finally died. During that whole time, there was no sign of the kind of individual, personal humanity uh, that we call uh, thought or self-awareness or consciousness. So can the body be healthy and the mind gone? And one can still live for years like this? Look, you can take cells from the skin of my arm and put them in a test tube and they'll continue to grow for 35 years in serial passage. Is that life? I, I think life is my self-awareness. It's what I know of the world and what the no world knows of me. The marvelous capacity of this collection of cells and wires and chemicals and heat to interchange with other human beings who are as aware of themselves as I am of mine. Lose that and one loses the person. Historically, when you were dead, it meant your heart and lungs were not working. But one of the problems in defining death is getting straight the definition from the signs of death. Nobody really thought you were dead when your heart and lungs stopped working. What they meant was, well, those are good signs, perhaps, that the soul is gone from the body. And the way you can tell that is if the heart stopped, if the lungs stopped. Those are criteria for determining whether death has taken place. But the definition probably was when the soul left the body. Today, in the secular world of medicine, there aren't too many people looking for souls, but they have a sense that personhood somehow is connected with the ability of brain activity to be present, that death should be understood, not so much as heart and lung function, but when the brain stops working, when it is irreversibly and totally shut down, there's no possibility for personhood. The debate then becomes, well, what are the signs of that? How do we know that's happened? Is it when the person is sort of unconscious, in a coma? Is it when there's no electrical activity from the brain? Is it when there's no reflexes left? So the dispute is about whether we can accurately diagnose the signs and the symptoms of death. We know what death is. I think everybody at this point in time agrees if your brain has stopped and it's irreversible, there's no brain activity, you're dead. The possibility of consciousness and being a person anymore is gone. But the question is, how can we detect the signs that that's happened? We can't sort of look directly at the brain. We've got to go through technology. We've got to go through diagnostic techniques to try and guess. Is the brain working or isn't it? That's where we have all these electrical readings and experts arguing about what do these signs and symptoms of brain activity mean, and that's where the controversy is.